Two years prior to the start of RTR Imperium Serectum in 272 BC, Pyrrhus of Epirus had a disastrous campaign in the Peloponnese, trying to put a pretender to the throne on the throne of Sparta. And in the retreat, his eldest son was killed. Now, while retreating back towards Macedon, he hears news that there is a civil dispute in Argos and his long-term rival, Antigonus Gonatus, was marching to meet him in battle. In order to secure the city against Antigonus Gonatus, Pyrrhus entered Argos in a stealthy manner, only to find that Antigonus's army was already there. That is where he met his eventual end via a roof tile thrown by an anguished mother. So in today's video, I'm going to show you how you can get Epirus to rise once again and become a prevalent power in Greece, whilst also retaining the legacy of the great man that was Pyrrhus. Hi guys, welcome back. I am Red Zed, and today we are here with another faction guide for RTR Imperium Serectum version 0.6 for one of my favorite factions. It is Epirus. And now this is a really good faction in RTR Imperium Serectum version 0.6 and a really fun one too. Just a quick note guys, unfortunately I'm having a few little issues with my saves at the minute so I can't release my Let's Play at the moment. So that will be coming very soon, but if you do want to see that, make sure you like and subscribe this video. That'd be fantastic. And if you do want to see Let's Plays that are already out, Rather Incoherent has an Achaean League Let's Play on his channel and Saul, I'm assuming Saul Tyre as well, go and subscribe to him because I'm assuming he'll have a Let's Play out at some point in the future. But with that out of the way, let's get into Epirus, guys. You start here on the western coast of Greece, west of Thessaly, with the Antigonids nearby and the Acarnanians and Aetolians down to your south. You start with eight settlements, so you start quite a decent size, not a one province minor, that's for sure, but none of these settlements are particularly amazing. That is one of the major problems with you. You also start at war with the Antigonids because you are trying to reclaim the throne of Macedon that Pyrrhus had taken all those years ago off Antigonus. Gennatus. So, you are already at war with Macedon right from the start, but that actually offers a lot of opportunities, and we're going to be going through that in this video. So, you have five large towns, which is actually really good. They're just not that powerful, and three towns, and honestly, most of them are Epirote as well. They are not Dorian. There's three that are Dorian, but most are Epirote. So, culturally, a really good start for you guys over here. The only thing with Epirote though, there's not that many settlements that are Epirote that you can see. So wherever you conquer is pretty much going to be a different settle, a uh, different culture uh, from your own. But that is the general overview of Epirus to start with. So let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of Epirus. First of all, the first strength is that you are in a relatively protected position. I mean, if we have a look at the movement out here, you can see there's only certain ways through all of these mountains. Like, it's really well protected. You're in a little alcove of mountains. So you shouldn't have too much of a problem defending your lands if you want to. The second strength is that you have a pretty darn decent roster. I'm not going to lie. You don't really get access to any good swordsmen at all. In fact, I don't think you have access to any swordsmen. But in terms of spearmen... And phalangites, you've got it all from basic phalangites to really elite ones to very elite spearmen as well and really elite cavalry too. So you've got a really good all-round roster, especially for a roster found in Greece. And your third strength, which might also be a bit of a weakness depending on what type of player you are, you do start at war with the Antigonids. No chance you're really going to be able to end that very soon unless you completely wipe them out very quickly. But I would say that being at war with the Antigonids to start with in this position is actually a strength. And I'm going to show you how you can use that going forward. But let's now talk about the weaknesses. Now, one of the weaknesses with Epirus, although you're in a protected position, there can be a point when very quickly 
you can be at war on multiple fronts and you can't really sustain it. You can have the GCS come down from the north, the Akarnanians from the south, and the Antigonids from the east. So the main thing is you've got to be proactive, but we'll show you how to do that later down the line in the video. Secondly, Rome, of course, is only just across the sea. So if you get some really bad RNG, which means random stuff happening, guys, then, uh, yeah, <laughs> Rome can come and kill you, and that's not very fun for anyone. I mean, trust me, nearly everyone in uh, Europe and the Middle East experienced Rome coming and killing them, and I don't think any of them enjoyed it. I'm not going to lie. Your third weakness is the fact that you don't really have any good archers. You don't get access to the Cretan or Neo-Cretan archers that many of the other Greek factions get access to. But to be fair, you've got such a good roster otherwise that it's really not going to make much difference to you. And lastly, guys, although you start with eight settlements, let me just show you this. If I uh, shift and right click, you can see the base farming level of these regions. They are awful. You can also see the trade goods, and there are none. You literally start with no trade goods in your land at all, and pretty much everywhere with low fertility, apart from Ambrakikos Kolpos, or Ambrakia over here. So, apart from Ambrakia, everywhere is low fertility, or below even that, and has no trade goods. So, although you have eight settlements, economically, you're not that rich early on at all. So, here we are with the Epirote roster, guys. And, generally, it's a very well-rounded Greek roster. A really nice roster, indeed. And you shouldn't have too many problems uh, beating the enemy with these rosters. Of course, they've got the standard Greek Hoplites and Thuriophoroi. They are fine. They're both pretty standard in terms of their stats, but later on, you get access to the Chionian Agima, which are a fantastic uh, spear unit, very close to the Hypastis that, Seleucids, that the Seleucids get. So, a really good spear unit indeed. Of course, the one thing that is conspicuously missing from this roster is any good swordsman. So you're either going to have to go up to the Thracian lands to get some AOR swordsmen or down into Rome, most likely, to get some good swordsmen. So you are very limited. It's pretty much just spearmen, but a well-rounded spear roster, I've got to say. In terms of your missile boyos, you've got the Greek slingers, Greek archers, Akontistai, and the Athamanian peltas, which are actually a quite okay Peltast unit. Not amazing, but not bad either. So a good Javi unit if you want a Javi unit that can have maybe stand up a little bit in melee, but not amazingly. Not compared to, say, the Thracian Peltasts, but still an okay Peltast unit and a good Javi unit overall. You also do not get a really good um, archer unit as part of your roster. You only get the Greek archers and slingers which is not very good, <laughs> because look at them, they're not good at all. So, uh, if you want a good archer, you're going to have to go for the AOR units of Crete, maybe get some Cretan archers, or Neocretans from somewhere. So yeah, archers is another weakness of the roster, but it's not too bad a weakness. But you do also have some very good phalangites. So, we've got the Deuteroi, which is your standard phalangite to start with, and they are not amazing. They're actually quite weak for a Phalangite unit, but to get these guys from the start of the game, whereas a lot of other factions in Greece do not get Phalangites until they get reforms, guys. So this is a really good bonus for you early on. Obviously, uh, the Antigonids get Phalangites without reforms, but these guys, um, you know, all the guys down south of you start to get phalangites after reforms. So you're going to be at quite a big advantage to all the southern little city-states that you're going to be fighting. Because even though these are not a great phalangite unit, they're still very good if used correctly, phalangites. I just like to uh, smash enemies with heavy infantry and not have to <laughs> mess around with phalangites. But that, of course, is me. You also get your Ambrachioti phalangites, which are like a standard sort of mid to high tier phalangite, quite good. 16 morale is really good. and the um, But then you get also the Epirote Pezhetiroi, the companion phalangite of Epirus. And you can see at the stats, these guys are amazing. 20, 20, and 43 defense. They are unreal. A fantastic phalangite unit. 
So when you get access to those, you can get access to them without even a reform as well. So as soon as you get that fourth tier recruitment, you can get these boys and absolutely smash people way before they even get access to phalangites. Cavalry wise, you've got some standard missile cavalry, the Thuriophoroi cavalry and the Prodromoi. You've also got the Zistophoria, which is your standard lance unit, which is a decent lance unit across all the Greeks. Obviously better than the Thuriophoroi and the Prodromoi in the old fight. And you get Greek General's Bodyguard, which is a fine General's Bodyguard. But the one unit that I really love in this roster, above all other units in the roster, is the Molossian Agima. These guys, like, we've, uh, like we'll say on the campaign map, are a fantastic cavalry unit. 45 charge, 27 defense, 18 morale as well, and 15 melee attack with 13 alt attack. So these guys are going to be absolutely brutal on the charge. With that 15 melee attack on that 45 charge, that is obscene. They are going to be very good. After your reforms, which is to get to one huge city, you also get access to the Espido Foroi. You get the Javelin version of the boys. So you get a sort of um, a javelin crossed with a heavy cavalry unit. So these guys are very versatile and pretty darn decent. Not as good in melee as the Molossian Agima, but also have those seven javis to throw into the enemy. So a good unit nonetheless. And it's whether you prefer missile cav or you just prefer heavy cav for which one I would go for. I prefer heavy cav, so I'm going to prefer the Molossians. But if you are a javi cav stan... I know there is a few of you out there. Then the Espido Foroi is the unit for you. I just wanted to add the elephants. They are synonymous with Epirus. Around this region, there is the opportunity around this region to recruit a few mercenary Indian war elephants. So do not pass up on that opportunity if you've got the money. You can't. I don't believe you can directly recruit these boys. But there should be a couple of mercenary pools around you that have access to these boys. And you can absolutely smash the enemy with them. Overall, missing good archers and swordsmen in this roster. But apart from that, it's a pretty darn good early game roster with your uh, Phalangites early game. When a lot of other people don't get them. And some really good spearmen and some good cavalry. So overall, a pretty darn good and balanced roster, I've got to say, for Epirus. One of my favorite rosters for sort of the smaller nations in the game. I really do like it indeed. But anyway, guys, back onto the campaign map. Now we've done the roster, guys. Let's have a look at our building roster. Like I say, same building roster as all the Greeks. But the temples are the thing that sets them apart. For these guys, they actually have some quite interesting ones. So we have Temple of Dionysus here that has 20% tax income. Or, sorry, has tax income as its bonus and just happiness. So this is quite a good one for a lot of your homelands. So you can get some extra taxes. Just remember, though, guys, taxes, the more you get into the game become less and less powerful and it sort of gets overtaken by trade quite a long way so this isn't that powerful of a temple the shrine to Dioscuri is your military shrine and it gives a bit of a mix of both experience to troops and a couple of armor bonuses sorry weapon bonuses for light weapons and missile weapons which you are going to need if you're playing as Epirus, so that you can get your archers with actually good stats. <laughs> because, like I say, you only get access to those cheap Greek archers. But if you are getting AOR Cretan archers or Neo Cretan archers, this is a good one to build in your recruitment hubs. Along with that, you get the Temple of Aphrodite, which offers population growth. Now, that is something, again, that you're very likely going to have to need in, in some of these really low fertility regions. So, yeah, you might need, because you can see, even on normal tax rate, this is only growing by a half a percent. So you've got to kind of judge whether you want the taxes or you want the growth in a lot of your homeland regions. And that is completely up to you. So let's now go through the starting moves and position of Epirus. Now, remember, guys, with these tactics, these are just, in my opinion, the easiest way to play the faction. I am not going for the most meta, uh, crazy tactic. Sail to Alexandria, sack it, burn all of Alexandria to the ground, come back rich, and then go for Rome and stuff. Like, 
If you want to do those crazy tactics, completely up to you. In fact, you might even do a completely different tactic to what I'm going to show you. But remember, these tactics that I'm showing you are, in my opinion, the easiest way to play the faction. The best way early game to play the faction. But of course, it is subjective and there are plenty of different tactics that you can use. But you can use this as a guide if you want to. So... As Epirus, to start with, of course, we do have a pretty darn nice army. And Alexander of Epirus is, in fact, a fantastic commander already. The third son of Pyrrhus. He is a really, really good commander. Although he's a drill master, and he's also at the start, uh, he hasn't been blooded yet. So he will get a minus one morale trait very soon as well. You've also got to be wary of this Antigonid army up to the north. It's a pretty decent size, and it will come and attack you. Let's stick extreme mode on for now, and uh, let's show you what you're going to do. First of all, we are going to min-max the economy. I'm going to get Alexander out, and I'm going to leave behind one unit of Greek slingers. Now, we're not going to worry about the Akarnanians to start with. They very likely will attack us very soon, but let's not worry about them to start with. Let's worry about the people we're already at war with. Another tactic you can do is rush for the Akarnanians to start with, take them out, um, and then go after Macedon. But for me, the best tactic early on is to go straight for Macedon, because you're already at war with them. Uh, you can also go for some of these rebel settlements, but look at the look at the uh, garrisons in here. It's actually massive, and also the Greek city-states have two massive armies here, so you really don't want to get to war with them. Same thing about this settlement here. It's got a big uh, Greek army in there, so... Really want to avoid that. Also, the reason why I wouldn't, me personally, of course, guys, go for the Akarnanians to start with is because as soon as I do that, we are then going to be bordering the Aetolians. And remember, guys, if you are bordering an AI faction, they are so much more likely to attack you, no matter what, even if you've got an alliance with them, especially on very hard or hard difficulty. A lot less likely on lower difficulties, but on those hard difficulties, if you're bordering a faction, it's only a matter of time before they come and kill you. So uh, that is why I want the Akarnanians as a buffer state, pretty much, to our south. And I also want this settlement here, Lamia, to act as a buffer against the Greek city-states and the Boeotians over here. So that we can pretty much have free reign in Thessaly and up north, where we're not bordering any other AI factions, and take Thessaly and then go north and try and take all of Macedon and become very rich in the process. That's the plan anyway. That is my recommended route. But of course, you're going to get, you know, things are going to happen in the middle where Akarnanians might attack you, the GCS Greek city-states might attack you, so you've got to react to that. But always mold yourself on your own RNG, guys. The stuff that happens to you guys. So, let's uh, min-max our economy. Let's go through all of these places. And we can pretty much put nearly all of them up to some good level of tax. We're already positive. We're already in the green. But you can see these places are not exactly the richest. 888 for a town over here. 1,000 for this large town is not too bad. But it's still not fantastic. 1,500 for this one is okay. But this one is very much out of the way. And you've got to put it down to low straight away. Which is a bit unfortunate. Um, you do also have a ship. It's up to you whether you, del you delete this, guys. Completely up to you. I would recommend not for a little bit. Because this guy's son will come of age in the first six turns or something. And if you delete that, then you're not going to be able to get him across. So it's up to you whether you want to just leave him in there, delete this and leave him in there, or you want him to come across and govern a city or two. Then uh, that is that is the choice, really, with the ship. Either you want the sun to come across, or you don't care about it, so you're going to disband it. But for me, I'm just going to leave it for now. It doesn't cost that much in upkeep. I believe it's only like 100 and something. 134. Yeah, it's not going to be majorly bad for us in the long run if we don't do anything with that for now so first moves we've min maxed the economy we're going to go straight for Pharsalos over here now whichever one you choose it's up to you could also go for Aegean but then we would have been going up through this way just because it has no walls 
But what I tend to like to do, even though these places have walls, is to go for fast loss early on and just clamp down on all this region. Take all of Thessaly, then start going north. But completely up to you, like I say, guys. Now, buildings-wise, I believe the best options we have are in Brachia. We can get a port that gives us 200 trade, which is fantastic. Secondly, what I'm probably going to do is get another troop. And I think I'm going to go rather than the Deuteroy. Let's go for the Hoplites. And go for that instead of getting another building. And then somewhere else, let's get the land clearance. That is the next best option we have available to us. So let's get the land clearance in Parseron. And that's us. So I'm going to end the turn, guys. And we'll see you in a little bit when a few of our plans have played out. While you are waiting for your plans to all come to fruition in Thessaly, guys, do remember to go around and talk to all of these smaller minor places. Try and get trade with them all if you can. Potentially an alliance as well, but always try and sell the map information. So I'm going to try 600 for these boys, and they will accept it. And you're going to get so much more money doing this. It's a bit gamey. If you don't want to do it, you think it's an exploit, don't do it. But if you want to do it, it's an option there for you. So now we're sieging down Pharsalos here, guys, as you can see. And the main thing we are worried about is that main big army. But if it comes, you should be able to defeat it, though. In my Epirus campaign um, that I played that I can't release because, unfortunately, save's broken. Uh, I did destroy it pretty handily on very hard, very hard. So if you're on lower difficulties, it shouldn't be too much of a problem, especially with your good cavalry and your phalangites who are decent uh, to start with. I mean, the Deuteroy, like I said in the roster thing, are not amazing phalangites, but phalangites in general are pretty good if you get them right. So uh, shouldn't be too much of a problem. For example, if this guy had been stood outside a city, I would have taken the draw out battle, guys. So if there's an army stood next to a city, if you attack that army and it doesn't retreat, it's going to bring the people from the city out. And if you kill 85% of both armies and the general, if they're a family member general, then you will get the city as well. So if they had stood in front of a city, we would have done the draw out. But for now, we are just going to siege down Pharsalos. And it's very likely that big Antigonid army is coming our way very soon. So here we are, guys. And you can see the army has taken the bait. And it's actually led by Selefkos this time, not Hermias who I believe it was led by in my Epirus campaign. Uh, but yeah, Selefkos over here. That is fantastic. I am so glad he has come down. Of course, remember guys, we are going to console command these battles because, like I said previously, if I fight all these battles, I will be here forever doing this guide and you will never get all of these guides uh, in good time. So we're going to do that. And then what I would do, once you've taken this settlement, remember, destroy the old Antigonid recruitment. That's going to give you some more money. We're going to go straight and fight Hermias. Sorry, Selefkos in this case. And again, we're going to auto win attacker. But in this case, uh, remember, guys, if you were fighting that on the battlefield, you would very likely have fully destroyed that army. So it wouldn't be too bad of a battle for you to have taken. And we're going to leave this back here, in there. We're going to keep the Athamanians in there. And then the next thing I would do, this is completely up to you. If you fully destroyed this army, what you can now do, I'm going to show you this tactic. It wouldn't work in this scenario because this army is still alive. But I'm going to go on the assumption that you have managed to fully destroy this army. If you have done that, what you can then do is have a look at these three settlements. And this is proper blitzing now, guys. So do pay attention if you don't know how to blitz. So we're going to get three. So we've got ten units. So we want uh, three, uh, well, one, four, and two threes. So you want to balance it out quite well. So probably this one, we want some Athamanians. We are going to go for that one. Demetrius, that's probably the weakest army. So I'm putting it the furthest away. I'm then going to take these boys and go for this one this one furthest away and then we're going to have the strongest army closest to Hermias. sorry so left cost not Hermias, sieging down this now you may notice that everywhere has two turns to build their rams which is unfortunate but with your extra money if you want to you could maybe recruit a mercenary 
to sort of uh, build that up slightly, but it's up to you to make it faster. But by doing this, so let's let's take um, one army into account with this blitzing. This is a blitz lesson now, guys. So let's take one army into account. If we didn't do this and we just did it via one army, what are we going to do? We're going to come here to Ferai. This one army is going to take one turn and then we're going to attack. So that's two turns taken. Uh, sorry, one turn taken. Then we're going to come across to here. And that straight away, that's another turn. So that's two turns at least. Then we're going to take it. Then we're going to go across to there. That's going to be another turn. So three turns. So the quickest you can do these battles is in three turns. Whereas if we split this up, it's going to take two turns. And you're going to get the benefit all at once rather than graduated as well. So in my opinion, this is better because <laughs> it's faster by one turn. You know, it's a 33% decrease in the amount of time you've got to take to take these cities. So in my opinion, it's better to do it that way if you are blitzing. If you don't want to do this, just put them all into one army and do one after the other. But for me, if we destroy that army, this is the tactic to use. Um, so let's have a look at some of our lands as well economically. And I have been saving up money for ports because if we have a look in here we build the port, how much money is that going to make us? Yeah, it's, it's really quite a lot of money for these ports. So I'm saving up for the large towns to build the ports. Like Oricon over here does have a port, which is fantastic. So that is all the ports now built. So the rest of the lands, apart from here, but it can't because it's a town. This place is actually ready to upgrade. It did not tell me that. But when they are ready to upgrade, or maybe it did. Let's have a look. Oh yeah, <laughs> literally I've just looked at that. Uh, so when, when you get the chance to upgrade these to large towns, guys, these smaller towns, absolutely do it so that you can build another port. Because the ports for Epirus seem to be, in my opinion, the best ways to go forward. So again, we're going to save a little bit of cash and we're going to build a port in there next. Sorry, we're going to build the, the, the upgrade in there next turn, which will be fantastic. Now, you generally see this quite a lot with the GCS. They'll be fighting the rebels over here. But as soon as they get that one, just be prepared, guys, that they're going to attack you. Two things to note. While we're here fighting uh, the Antigonids, we are weak against the Akarnanians and the Greek city-states who could launch an army from here at any point. So if they do, just be calm. Take the settlement that you are sieging down and then come back and try and beat them back. We did get an, uh, a Greek hoplite trained in there, but for now, I'm just going to leave him there because once we've taken these, it's very likely you're going to want to retrain at least a few men. And once they're retrained, we can come back or the Akarnanians might attack you. So you might have to come back anyway and you can pick them up on the way. But for now, we're going to leave him in there. Just for now, if you want to, you can definitely send him across. So let's just pretend that we do want him. So we're going to send him across and yeah instantly blocked by the Akarnanians, unfortunately. And they won't be very happy we're walking across their land. But anyway, who really cares? It's the Akarnanians, right? <laughs> but anyway, guys, I'll see you in a couple of turns when this blitzing has worked. So, guys, we are here now, and we did get attacked by Selefkos again, which is why we managed to take this in the end turn last time. So we are going to destroy this building, of course. And we also got offered a Man of the Hour, but unfortunately it didn't complete. I have no idea why. We've had a couple of towns expand because we enslaved. Remember, always enslave, guys. Don't exterminate. If you exterminate, you get rid of this population so that it's never seen again. Whereas if you, of course, um, enslave, the population is going to be put around the rest of your lands and it's going to be fine. Now, the problem we have here is on the last end turn, something very weird happened. I have never seen this before, and I have no idea why, but Masene thinks it wants to come and have a go because it thinks it's hard enough. So, <laughs> I have no idea why this has happened, but on the same turn as well, the Akarnanians have declared war on us. Now, what I was talking about before was this guy has just come of age. So, that is why I kept the ship. So that when this guy, Cleonimos of Sparta, has died, we can now send him across to there to govern this city rather than leaving it undefended. But let's have a look at Messene's army. It looks pretty trash, I'm not going to lie. So let's take these settlements and let's assess what we want to do next. 
So all these settlements are now taken, guys. So we are, of course, going to delete the recruitment. It's going to give us loads of cash, which is fantastic. We love a bit of cash, don't we? Now we've got to react, though. This is what I was talking about, going after the Antigonids and then reacting to whatever happens uh, with the Akarnanians and apparently Messene or anyone else that might do something crazy like this. Now we've kind of got to abandon this land. Now... What you can do, you can leave a some of these smaller troops in there, maybe by uh, combining them. If you'd have done all these battles manually, you will have loads more troops than this. So it is, you know, mainly a problem with the fact that we auto-resolved all of these battles. So I'm going to bring you guys out that way. Probably going to leave the Thurio Foroi behind because they're slightly weaker than what we've got there. And in this case, I may leave the Ambracioti Phalangites behind because we can't actually retrain those boys. So, coming this way, we are going to get here. And this army is pretty darn rubbish right now. But that, of course, is because we auto-resolve these battles rather than actually taking them. So, we are going to come back, deal with Messene, and then go straight for old Akarnania. Probably with a retrain at Ambracia as well. Maybe taking out this army on the way, but we shall see. Uh, we shall see, guys. Like I say, you want to take this bit of Thessaly, and then if there is any problems happening with Akarnania, etc., then go and do that. Let's chance our arm. Oh, dear. Clear defeat. Actually, can we walk across here? Oh, my God. I'm sorry, guys. 100% delete that ship. It is not needed. You can walk across. I... I'm sure I saw that in the Epirus campaign as well. I've just forgotten. So sorry about that, guys. You definitely want to uh, delete your ship early on <laughs> in this case. But we got loads of cash now. So we're going to do a bit of building. I'm going to show you some min-max buildy stuff we can do. So we're going to build, uh, repair everything in these cities. So let's have a look. Let's repair that. And let's see what we can do with our taxes over here. It looks very much like normal is probably the highest... We can really go. So in Thebai Fathiadrites, we're going to get that. We're going to get the farms. Apparently that provides nothing. Uh, surely that's wrong. I don't know. I think it might be because it's queuing in these first. No. What? Okay. Land clearance is just population growth bonus apparently here when it gives money elsewhere. Does it not? Let's have a look. I could be being complete. Yeah, it gives money normally. So I have no idea why that's uh, why that's not working. But anyway, it's fine. We're not going to build it there then. We're also, yeah, we're not going to build it there. Let's have a look at this settlement if we can. So let's build here the land clearance, maybe the roads. Or we can go for the Shrine to Dionysus. That's always a good option. But we've got richer lands over here, so we're going to prioritize them first. This is building already. This one can now upgrade. We've also got another one that has upgraded already. So let's make sure we get those upgrades in so we can get better buildings very quickly. You can see we are building the port there. We are building the farms over there. We're building that in there. And we did just finish the port in Embrakia, but we cannot, uh, we cannot do anything with it right now. So uh, that's unfortunate, but it's fine. And then anywhere else over here that's not building that we want to build in. No, everywhere over here apart from Ambrakia is building, but Ambrakia is under siege, so it can't build right now. So let's build in Pharsalos instead. Let's get the communal farming. Please tell me that's going to give us money. Yes, it is. <laughs> Fantastic. So guys, like I say, what you want to do, take this part of Thessaly and just react to what happens with the AI. Like I said, it's very likely that the Akarnanians are going to declare war on you around the first 10 turns. And when they do, you can go and smash them. Also, this is very rogue and out of the blue. I was not expecting that. But we are going to go, of course, take Ambrakia back. Because it's the only place we can really train right now. Um, one other thing to note, guys. One other thing to note. Is if we have a look at our third recruitment here. You will notice this AOR unit. The Thessalian Cavalry. Now, this is a fantastic cavalry unit. A really good AOR cavalry unit. So when you can get hold of that, get hold of it because it's really good. But also you do have the Molossian Agama that we've seen before. They are also a fantastic cavalry unit. So 
But between the Thessalian Lancers and the Agima, you should be absolutely fine for cavalry and have fantastic cavalry. Well, let's end the turn, guys, and see what happens. So, guys, here we are. And, yeah, Messene is still in there. Now, if you are at the point where I am, where your army's pretty battered from these, maybe you're, you know, less experienced on battles and that first battle really did take a toll, then what you can do is bring all of the troops out of these nearby areas the generals as well and your army and you should be then plenty strong enough to fight them and also your generals especially should have the movement points to go back to their cities afterwards as well for us we are just going to join okay no nope, we're going to smash that out the way and apparently we have to go through them so let's do that 48 casualties is not what we need right now but we're going to come into here and we're going to smash that army and like I say, if you have fought all the battles manually, you should have plenty enough army to beat whatever that is. Just Greek hoplites. Terrible army that Messene has brought. And we're going to sit back in Ambrakia. And now you can see, even with these sieges, even with the Antigonids blockading us, we are making 6,000 a turn already, which is really nice. The key thing, guys, when, you, when something like that happens, like Messene coming and sieging down Ambrakia, don't panic. Just don't panic at all. You don't need to. You have loads of settlements. So even if they had taken Ambrakia then on that turn, it wouldn't be a problem. Don't worry about it. Just go and siege them down. Take it back and you'll be absolutely fine. Do not panic in any situation. For example, if the Antigones brought a massive full stack back down here. That's fine. The AI is generally is a bit of a turtle. Uh, sorry, a tortoise when it comes to, uh, comes to taking settlements. So it really doesn't matter. It'll, they'll take like three turns to take one settlement. So you've got plenty of time. And of course, you have a brain. So you are going to do better tactical moves than the AI by a long way. So let's also retrain all of these guys. It's going to be pretty much all of our money. So when we're in this situation, we'll do that. We'll also probably get our hands on another Thurio Foroi in there, which will be good. That is all of our money spent on to uh, on troops this turn. But we are still building pretty much everywhere, which is fantastic. A couple of buildings being done, but we are building in a lot of places. So, guys, I think this is where I will probably end those starting moves. Because I've covered the most important thing. It's to go for the Antigonids right away. And then react to whoever declares war on you afterwards. Because you already start at war with the Antigonids, you've got to go for them and try and blitz Thessaly. Or, if you want to, blitz further north. But my, you know, best place, I think, is Thessaly because Lamia is kind of a buffer state against all the states that might declare war on you down below. Now, the Akarnanian situation is one that you've got to handle very carefully. Because if we come and take Stratos, for example, now, the Aetolians are very likely to declare war on you because now you'll start bordering them. So what I would recommend you trying to do is trying to take Stratos and then make the Akarnanians a protectorate and give Stratos back so that it's a buffer state for you so that the Aetolians won't declare war on you at all. But that's up to you guys whether you want to do that or you could just take Stratos Go back to the Antigonids until then the Aetolians declare war on you and do the same thing. React to it, come back, beat the Aetolians, then go back north and keep pushing through the Antigonids. The main thing, like I say, is just beating back the Antigonids because look at this land. It's so undefended. So little troops defending it. And you can absolutely smash Antigonids into oblivion if you want to really quickly with these blitzing tactics that I've shown you early on. Now, if this was my campaign, if this was the RNG that has been shown to me right now and I was playing this campaign, what would I do? Remember, this is based on what has happened so far. Well, first of all, I would ignore Masene. I don't think they're going to come back after that. And it's very likely they're probably going to get attacked by the Spartans or something at some point. So uh, yeah, I'd probably leave them be for the time being. I would come down to Stratos, besiege it. That would very likely break this siege. And this guy might even do us a favor and come back and attack us so we can do a draw out battle rather than a siege battle. When Stratos is taken, I try to offer it them in the ceasefire for a protectorate status. If it doesn't allow you to make them a protectorate, guys, then 
what I would probably do is hold on to it and fully destroy them. And then go back north, retrain the troops, then go back north. And it'll be a few turns before the Aetolians declare war on you. But you can see, at this point, we're making a lot of money. So we can afford to now start training more troops and start actually getting to the point when we can have a full stack. And when we're at that point, we are pretty much in a really good situation because we are not far from anything. Look at the movement this general's got, and he has moved already quite a bit. So Alexander over here, you can move like from here. Like, if we get one of these guys, if they were a general, look how far you can move just with a troop, not not with a general. With a general, you can march all the way up to uh, Pella if you wanted and siege that down straight away. But that's completely up to you if you want to go rogue with the tactic. I prefer to just make my way up north through the Antigonids. But like I say, completely up to you, and it's got to be molded on your RNG. If the Aetolians do declare war on you, go and take them out because they can get quite strong quite quickly. Uh, and then go back to the Antigonids. You're going to have to bounce around a lot in this campaign. Between being attacked and then going on the offensive. And when you get to the point when you have two full stacks. That's when you can be constantly on the offensive. Which is fantastic. So guys, I hope that has really helped. Um, like I say, main steps. Go and take Thessaly. Then react to whatever happens with the RNG and the AI attacking you. React to that. Put them down if they do attack you. Then go back on the offensive and then rinse and repeat. React to what the AI does, but keep on the pressure on the Antigonids. Do not let them build up another big army because that's going to be problematic for you down the line. Whilst also building up your very weak economy to start with, with ports and upgrading these areas so that they can actually have ports later down the line. Ports and farms seem to be the best options very early on, guys. As we can see, and we're already making 6,800, even with a siege going on, which is really, really good money for, like, says three turns. We're probably about six turns into the game, and we're making 6,800. So, plenty of money for the sixth turn in the game. But anyway, guys, let's talk about the difficulty, then. So, difficulty-wise, guys, Epirus is pretty darn easy, in my opinion. It is a fantastic nation to start out with if you're not experienced with the mod or you are sort of new to Rome Total War, then I would recommend Epirus because they are a pretty darn easy, easy faction and it's going to teach you a lot and at the same time. It's going to teach you how to blitz. It's going to teach you that the AI is a backstabbing bastard, which is a lesson that everyone needs to learn who plays Rome Total War at some point. And it's also going to teach you how to manage your economy with a weak starting economy but not so weak that you're really struggling. So I think it's a fantastic nation to start with. So if you are new to the mod, this is very likely the nation for you to start and try out. And like I say, it's a very reactive campaign where you're reacting to what the AI does a lot. So again, you're going to be bouncing around and fighting lots of different things and learning how to fight different Greek rosters as well. So a really fantastic faction overall, I would say, for a new player. So I'd really recommend this faction to you if you are new. But difficulty-wise, I cannot give it a 1. I'm not going to lie. When the Belge exist with no enemies and exist in a really strong position with some of the strongest uh, armies in the world, I can't give Epirus a 1, unfortunately. But I will give it a 2 out of 5. We've had 2 5 out of 5 so far. So this is a lot easier. 2 out of 5 for me. It's not that difficult. But it is a really fun faction and also a fantastic one to learn the ropes with. So, I hope you have enjoyed, guys. If you did enjoy, please do like and subscribe. It would really help the channel out, especially on our road to 5,000 subscribers. But anyway, guys, I hope this has helped you out. If it has, comment down below your campaign as Epirus and what you did. That would be fantastic. But thank you very much for watching, guys. It's been a pleasure, as always. And I will see you all again on the next video.